A lot of people need help growing YouTube channels. And one of the people who can help you take your channel to the fullest potential is Paddy Galloway. So tell us about yourself. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me on, man. I am a YouTuber first and foremost, but I also work as a YouTube consultant, primarily for very large channels, optimizing their, their thumbnails, their titles, their videos to make some viral content. Um, and I've been doing it for a long time and it's been a lot of fun. So it's a dream job for me. First, let's talk about your YouTube channel. Don't get into the consulting. But first, who was your inspiration to start YouTube? Honestly, because I've been doing YouTube for such a long time, and like we were talking off air about how I was really impressed by, you know, at your age, you're getting out there and you're you're making yeah. content yourself. I was doing that when I was your age as well, and actually even younger back in 2007, 2008. The, the difference was I was doing it behind like faceless accounts and like, you know, just like I didn't have my actual face out there. Uh, but I've always I've always done YouTube for, you know, the last 15 years, basically since YouTube's inception, I've been making YouTube videos in some, I don't, I can't really pinpoint any one person that was an inspiration at the start. Like along the way, there's been lots of creators I've really enjoyed watching. Um, but when it came to my own channel, my personal channel that, ever, that people who are watching this podcast know me from, um, there was no one making creative breakdowns before I was. So there wasn't like a reference point of like, oh, this channel is making creative breakdowns. There was no one. So I essentially was researching YouTube myself for my own channel because I've had I've had plenty of other channels that were also doing quite well. And, you know, I was, I was researching, I was, I was learning YouTube, I was studying YouTubers myself. And then one day I was like, okay, here's some notes I took on Peter McKinnon. You know, these are some pretty interesting notes. What if I make it into a YouTube video? And from there, I, I essentially just, you know, I took the, the kind of whiteboard format and combined it with like the video essay style. You'll see people like um, Nerdwriter and Polymatter, these channels use combine them together. I had no idea it would work so well, but it did. And, and here we are. How did you study the channels? Like just, just by watching their videos or, or another way? I mean, I think one of the best ways to study is, is to already have a good understanding yourself. Because when you've got a good understanding yourself, you can start to pick things out of, of, of channels and start to realize all the reasons they did certain things. And so my initial understanding came from doing YouTube first and like actually just learning and making mistakes and, you know, making thousands of videos. I've actually made thousands of videos, even if there's only a few on my channel. Um, and mm -hmm. so that was where my initial understanding came from. And then when I'm actually studying the YouTubers, at least in the early days, I would just watch every one of their videos, try to see if there was a, a sudden shift. So I'd like open up their social blade and I'd see like when they started growing really fast and try to correlate that to something they changed in their content. Maybe they started making a different series or a different type of thumbnail at that point. And that gives you a good reference point of what was the, the catalyst for their growth. Yeah, but that definitely is a good way. Social way is such a... For sure. No, it, it's it's the OG too. It's great. Mm -hmm. So like you mentioned, you had some other channels in 7, 7, 8. What was the most one of those channels had grown? And what kind of videos were you doing on that? Yeah, before my current channel, I had a I had a music channel uh, called RMTV, which we grew to about 50 or 60 million views. I think about 120,000 subscribers. And it was it was an Irish focused music channel. So for Ireland, that's that was a pretty big deal, especially back then when YouTube wasn't as big. So I, ha I had that and I had a few other, you know, different channels and different niches, like basically whatever interest I was in into. So if I was into sport, football, I created a channel and I would say 95% of them failed. <laughs> they didn't work at all. But then the ones that did, I started to learn from. And I was like, oh, there's, there's a reason this one works better than this one and, and whatever. Reason. Yeah. You said that like every new interest made a channel, every interest I made it on the same video, like on, on the same channel. Like on my podcast channel, I have like tons of like unlisted videos of like cooking videos, manga videos, vlogs, and like tons of like random things. And now I found the podcast, so I'm going to stick to it and unlist it and in a playlist. But yeah, it sounds like we're kind of similar hobby. people because yeah. if, you, if you love YouTube, whatever, whatever hobby you're into outside, the first thing you think, could I make a YouTube channel around this? That, that was always yeah. my thing. It was like, I, I was into like, yeah, at one point I was into health and fitness and like the gym and I was like, I, I should definitely make a YouTube channel around this. So yeah, I'm, I'm the same kind of person. Yeah. That's a good way to think because like, yeah. For sure. So what gave you the idea to start consulting? Honestly, it, it came from, and this is something that's been a, a kind of a hallmark of everything I've done. It came from people asking. So I was doing the videos and I, I never had this plan to, to start doing consulting, but I was doing the videos and I kept getting people reaching out to me saying, Hey, could you give me some help with my channel? Could you give me some feedback on how I'm doing things here and there? Sometimes these channels were pretty big, pretty big channels. And I don't know, I did that with a few people and I started to realize, cause at the time I wasn't even charging. I was just giving free feedback. I was like, Oh, this is a good thumbnail. You should do it like this. So you should do this idea and stuff. And I was like, Oh, this is actually really useful. So then in 2020, um, a channel called Loverfella reached out to me. So he's a Minecraft channel with, I think right now he's got three or three or four million subscribers. And he reached out to me in 2020 and he was like, hey, Paddy, you know, I really like your video. I heard you do some stuff outside of YouTube. Would you like to come and work as a creative director for me? And I started working with him and we started building up his channel. And by the time we left, we'd scaled it to about 60 million views a month. And 
it was a really fun experience. And I, I, I really realized, you know, if you can provide views for people, that's like providing currency for people, that's providing money, essentially. And the techniques I was using, the, the tactics we were using with Loverfella, but also other clients, which I started to take on along that journey, I was like, damn, this works. And I think something I, I, I think people make mistakes with is like, you know, they want to be something. So like, let's say you want to be a YouTube consultant um, and you skip a step, like you don't go through like the learning phase and the experimentation and the actual proving it and the results. And the way I put it nowadays is I wouldn't have a business if I couldn't get results. So that's kind of, yeah. that's kind of where it's come from. It's been working and I keep, I keep, keep building on top of it. Exactly. I don't know. What is a creative director? A creative director in YouTube terms is essentially someone who's going to help with ideas, thumbnails, titles, just behind the scenes. It's, it's, it's a very similar role to like just a, you know, a kind of overall channel manager or overall creative channel manager who's helping run the channel. So like with, with um, Loverfell, I was just helping with, you know, which ideas we make and uh, how the videos were actually paced, like the structure of the videos and uh, the thumbnails and stuff like that. So it's kind of a, a mixture of, of everything to do with you. Do you think like all channels of overflow size, like need to have a creative director, like a producer or something like that? Or you think it's just like optional? I mean, for, for very large channels, as much help as you can get, I think is, is important. And I, I think that's, um going back to that point, that's a bit of a difference with what I do. I'm not necessarily a YouTube consultant for small channels. I have worked with some small channels and I do do occasionally calls with small channels, but primarily I work with big channels because I understand that, you know, big channels, obviously they have more budget, they have more resources, but they also have a team yeah. that I can help work with. Uh, so generally speaking, I'd say, you know, as a smaller YouTuber, you know, let's say under... 500k subs having a creative director probably isn't a big priority but then when you grow and you get bigger and you build out a bigger team it's it's important to have people that can support you with ideas for sure yeah definitely so now that your consulting has kind of grown who is like the most interesting person that you have consulted mr beast no question at all not a doubt in my mind honestly like did he reach out to you did you reach out to him how did that go basically i'm interested yeah, and, and I, I should also add, no no disrespect to any of my other clients because they're all smart, smart and really interesting people too. But Mr. Beast is is definitely one of the most interesting people I've talked to full stop, yeah. even outside of YouTube. Um, essentially, when I first made a video on him back in 20, 2019, he just reached out and messaged me and followed me on, on my social. Um, and we had a few little chats here and there on, on social media, just like, you know, things like, you know, him like saying, I like that video or just replying to some of my tweets here and there. And That's then cool. in... Yeah, it was, it was really just kind of like casual. It wasn't like a, anything too formal. Then we had like a, a couple of little conversations over the phone. I talked to some of you know, his team members and they saw I was doing a really good job at Loverfella. And they saw, you know, I, I was really driven and hungry to, to, to work on YouTube. And they realized that, you know, I, I definitely knew some things that could help them. And I, I definitely had the right attitude towards towards uh, the whole platform. And essentially, um, Jimmy called me one day and we, we had like a two hour conversation and he was like a really really like what you're doing. I'd love to see if there's a way that we can work together. But it was kind of casual. It was kind of loose. It was like, you know, sometime like we'll, we'll reach out and do something together. And that, that same evening, he sent me a video of his, um, which I think it was the the ice cream video, the $100,000 golden ice cream. And he sent me that video. And it was like any notes on this because it hadn't, it hadn't released yet. It was just the actual, the edit. He was like, do you have any notes to how we could improve this? And I went through and it was like 1 a.m. Irish time when I got the, the link and I was like, I'm going to do this for him. I'm going to stay up. I'm going to give him some notes. So I went through and I left like 50 or 60 notes on the, uh, on the video. And then him, him and his, like some of his other team members just called me, you know, three or 4 a.m. Irish time. And we're like, yo, we want to, we want to work with you because they really like the, the notes I gave. And then, yeah, that's, that's how that happened. I worked with him for, I think four months uh, between January and April or May of 2021. And definitely the most interesting clients I've worked with. Do you think if you like, would have gone to sleep and then in the morning gave the what something different happened or do you think it was the same thing i i think the same thing like the same thing probably would have happened but i just didn't want to leave that the chance you know it's like especially yeah. the, the thing I, I i i was watching um the Kanye West documentary on netflix and there's a specific yeah. guy in it called dame who's like the ceo of, of this big record label and he was doing an interview after that documentary came out and he was like you know i had a beat that i, need, I needed it to be produced and I sent it to a producer and he was like, oh, that's going to take like two weeks, but I'll get back to you on it. And he was kind of annoyed. And then he sent it to Kanye West and Kanye West stayed up for like 24 hours straight and just gave that gave him the beat, and, you know, within a day. And that's when like he, he got in like Dame's good books. And I, I was I think that's a kind of a similar thing with me, obviously on a much smaller scale, but very similar. It was like, you know, I, I got a yeah, little yeah, opportunity yeah. and I, I made sure I took it right. What's like most important thing, like the craziest thing you learned from working with Mr. Beast and his team? Um, so I think 
I think most of what we covered, like the thing about YouTube and the thing about people at his level is a lot of people think he he has like some sort of like evil secret about the algorithm or, or something. But the reality is he just the most important things better than anyone else. So the, mo the most important thing I learned was just how far you can push YouTube. So for example, like, you know, most people spend, you know, a few hours on a thumbnail. Well, what if you, what if you hire like loads of people and they spend, you know, a week on a thumbnail Days. like what does the thumbnail yeah. look like it's like every everything was scaled to another level and i know that stuff sounds like seems kind of obvious from the outside but when you actually go in and work there you realize you know the level of detail the absolute attention to the smallest of margins is focused on and i love that because that's the kind of person i am yeah well, when he got interviewed by Colin, he said like he had like 70 80 something like team members and that was like what months ago i can't imagine now if it's like constantly posting like we're hiring like on Twitter. I can't imagine how much he's like scaled it, how much bigger it is even now. Yeah, that, that's now that's he's point. he's building a, a little empire <laughs> or maybe a big empire in North exactly. Carolina. So who do you think is like one YouTuber, not counting Mr. Beast, that like small YouTubers should study the most? Not counting Mr. Beast. That's probably the answer. Yeah, I think I think Ryan Train is doing a really good job because he's got a nice combination of you know great stories and great ideas like Mr. Beast. But he mixes in a good bit of, of his personality and like his, you know, you don't necessarily feel too distant from him. You get a good connection with him. So I think he, I think he does a, a great job of that. He's, he's definitely worth studying. Yeah. Um, one thing I do always say, though, is some of the best people to study are people who are blowing up right now. So even mm -hmm. even someone like Jimmy, he blew up, you know, he's, he's kind of always blowing up with it. His yeah. growth point was maybe like when he first started getting momentum was like 20, 2018, 2019. And then Ryan, kind of similar, maybe 2019 ish. Then 2021, he had a, a comeback as well. Um, but it's really interesting to see, okay, who's growing right now and what are they doing that's interesting and different? And even if they're small YouTubers, like if a small YouTuber goes viral, you know, what what was it about that video that made them go viral? I think that's a really interesting thing to study. Yeah, definitely. It's like all that stuff is really interesting to me. But yeah. You're what? I missed your last bit. Oh, yeah, that, like all this like interesting to me because there's like so many different ways it can happen. Like, so yeah exactly exactly so you're doing twitter threads like what gives you idea to start doing like twitter stuff like that um to be honest i i did i, I started doing them a, a quite a long time ago and um, probably like maybe a year or two maybe two years ago and every time i've done them they've just done well like the initial inspiration for them is like my videos i make once a month pretty much so the twitter threads are a nice way to still put out good information but more frequently and, and also to address different points. So I've had certain threads on there about specific parts of YouTube that I can't really go into depth on a, a YouTube video because everyone would just fall asleep. But I can I can yeah. make a, you know, I can make a, a long thread about that exact same thing. So it's been a mixture of like just having things to say anyway. And then I've always been good at writing. It's like my biggest skill is, is just copywriting. English was always my best subject in schools. It kind of, it's, I find it quite easy to write an engaging thread that people want to want to retweet. Yeah, every time I read like one of the threads, like my mind is like locked in. Like I want to continue reading it. So yeah, they definitely are very cool. They do help a lot of people out. Yeah, they've been, they've been doing really well. I think uh, I have one recently that got kind of like, I think in the range of like 500 retweets, which on Twitter, especially for like my Twitter account, it doesn't have like hundreds of thousands of followers or anything. That's a pretty big deal. So yeah, they're, they're doing really well. And I'm, I'm happy to see that they're helping people because I've had I've had messages from people who are like, you know, I can't, I can't afford to work with you or I, you don't have any space to work with. But I just watch your videos and read your tweets and it's helped me so much on my channel. So I'm just yeah. glad to, to be able to do that for free. Yeah. A lot of people definitely gain a lot of money, just value from your videos, stuff like that. So yeah. For sure. So now let's get into some like actual questions about YouTube and how to grow and stuff like that. So what's a simple AVD trick that's underutilized? Um, I think, uh, and when I say on, when you say underutilized, it's a little difficult because some people do it well, but some people don't. And to me, to me, it is, it, the trick is really getting really, really good at intros. And I know everyone says that, and it's almost like cliche of, oh yeah, make good intros. But still to this day, I, I watch so much YouTube content and we're talking from smart creators. Like it's not even just beginners. It's, it's smart top creators that still make these mistakes. And um, they just don't put enough emphasis on, you know, the first, the, the opening sort of, even like the opening five seconds. Like I really I want to talk about a retention hack. How, how's your opening five seconds? Because if you look at a retention curve, you know, in, in those first like five to 10 seconds, you're losing a lot of people. And that just happens anyway. There's no way to completely eradicate that fall off. But I have just been obsessed with, okay, how can we change that fall off from maybe, you know, 10% after seven seconds, or, you know, maybe it's 15% after 10 seconds. How can we like level that off a little bit? How can we, how can we keep retention at like 95% after seven seconds? How can we how can we hold retention at 85 percent at 30 seconds um so for me it's it's kind of you know when people ask me what's the best avd trick most of the things that people you know 
that don't know enough about YouTube will mention are just like kind of little gimmicks and little hacks of like, oh, like sometimes people say like play it, play something really fast so that people have to rewind and watch it again. But that's not like it's not really good for the viewing experience. It's just a little gimmick. Mm -hmm. To me, it's mainly about, OK, our is our opening 30 seconds the most engaging thing we can do? And speaking of Mr. Beast, he's, he's talked publicly in the past about, you know, sometimes he'll he'll actually say his hook like 50 different times, like in different ways and like record every single one. And then mm -hmm. the team will like play it back and see which is the best. So I, I think that's, that's the thing for me with AVD. It's like, are you starting your videos right? Because, you know, so many people have intro reels or like just boring starts. Like I write yeah. the hooks for a lot of my clients. Like I actually write them, ghost write them essentially for them. Sometimes, not always. Uh, you know, I've, I've trained a lot of my clients to get really good at writing hooks themselves, but at the start, it's often like they just use language, which is just kind of fluffy and, not really punchy enough. Like I'm looking for like, this is this, or like, here is the way you do this. You know, I want, I want something that's going to grab the viewer right away. Not something like, Hey, welcome to the video today. We're going to cover it. You know, it's just too boring. Yeah, definitely. And like one of my best performing videos, which was the tour of like, yes house, like in the first 10 seconds, it drops 30 like percent average duration because I did the thing you said about the snippets of the video. Um, and then I like, added photos that just like brought it down 40 percent like just yeah i don't know exactly the funny thing is though over. yeah the, the thing the thing about retention which you might have seen from my threads anyway but it's always important to know is the percentage is a great like benchmark of things of, of to base you know where your videos are but you also always have to take that context of the fact that that video did really well so it probably got pushed out to a broader audience which meant that the broader audience was even more likely to click off so it's going to lower the percentage yeah but even at that, yeah, you're right. Like that, starting like that could have, like if it did well, like how many views did it get? Um, well, it got like 370 views, but yeah. No, but still, I mean, we, we, all, we all start somewhere. Point, we all start I'm, somewhere. I'm getting like 100 views, 70 views because of so many content switches. So that was like amazing. Yeah, no, I, no, honestly, never, never, um, never understate the views because that's still 370 people. You know, it's still, it's still a lot of people exactly. thinking about them lined up. Um, like put them in a room. Exactly, like, ex exactly. Because I, I've, I've felt that sometimes where I, I hold my own content to such a high standard. And the thing about my content is it it's very evergreen. So it grows a long time. Over, like it grows over time. It never really starts that fast. In fact, like I think like over half my video um, in the first week, they've started very slow. Like they've started with like, I don't know, like 20, 30,000 views in the first week. And then they pick up from there. Um, but the thing for me is like, I've had a few videos because obviously every YouTuber does. I've had some videos that hit 100K and I'm disappointed with that. And then I think I'm like, you know, it's 100,000 people. Like, you know, like, like yeah. the entire state that I live in, in Ireland, there isn't 100,000 people in it, you know? So it's it's a bit of a reality. Yeah. And the, the thing that like so weird to me, like I have two different videos pulled up. Like one is like, a, they're, they're about the same YouTuber. YouTubers, yes, theory. Like the merch review has a thousand views. I know you have me touring the house as 300 views, but the one of me touring the house has more average view duration, but got less views, which is like just so interesting to me, like why that happens. Well, it's, it's not always a, like the thing about YouTube is it's, it's multifaceted. It's not like, you know, cause maybe the, the AVD was better, but maybe the actual click through rate and the actual um, interest, not just even the click through rate percentage, but the actual interest in that video wasn't as high. Um, it's, it's how they, it's how they relate together. Sometimes like, yeah. I, I get clients because, sometimes and they're like, how come my worst video has like really good AVD? And I'm like, the thumbnail and title was so bad and the idea was so bad that only your most dedicated viewers watched it, which led to good AVD, but YouTube just didn't show it to the, the broader audience because they didn't get yeah. clicks. But yeah, like also the merch video is more like searchable. So that might yeah. be another reason why. Probably. So for someone that does longer videos like me, I do like 40 minute podcast. How does someone keep getting the viewer engaged that like someone not make the viewer click off like 20 minutes in i think um with podcasts is a little different you know and that, that's that's another thing about youtube advice is i have to when i'm giving advice on twitter it has to be for a broad audience so i can't really be mm -hmm. like you know if you make you know hour-long podcasts here's what you do and two minute videos here's what you do i have to kind of give broad advice but for podcasts like some things i i've observed is i think i think podcasts to get good retention at the start they just start with like a really juicy question so I think this interview is going well. I think you're asking me really good questions, but maybe we Thank could you. have started with you asking me something like, you know, maybe you could have thought up ahead of time, like the very first question could have been something so engaging. And it wasn't just like, cause our first question, you know, tell me about yourself, which is a good question to start things with. Could you ask me something juicier at the start? That's kind of the, the tip that I would give you. The Mr. Beast question, I could have put that in the beginning. You could have. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe in editing, I could put the question first. So it's like, sounds, sounds like an idea to me. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really good idea. So 
So what are your opinion on shorts? Do you think it's uh, a good way to build the audience? Do you think it's just to build a short-term audience? What are your general opinions on it? Generally speaking, I think shorts are a good way to build a shorts audience. You know, like there is there is that level of separation between short form or long form still on YouTube. And I think some people make the mistake of, of thinking that they can just build a shorts audience and then transition to long form seamlessly. And there are occasions where that does work for channels. I've seen channels that have made that transition successfully. But it's not straightforward because all your traffic sources are built up in the short, like all your all your traffic is coming from the shorts feed. Whereas with long form, your traffic is going to come from search browsers suggested. So even though you've got views on your channel, those views are coming from shorts feed and YouTube don't have data on, you know, your browsing suggested views. They don't have enough data there to see if that's that's um you know worthwhile promoting your video in, the, in those different feeds. The way I see it right now and the way I'm, I know YouTube, because I I have a little bit of communication with YouTube. I kind of know roughly how they, they think about things. And I know they are putting a lot of em emphasis on shorts. So I think they're worth doing, but they shouldn't be the only thing you're doing. If you're, if you're trying to build a long form audience, you should do both. Um, and also I, one of my dislikes is when someone is trying to build a long form audience and they make like 50 shorts and like one long form and then 50 shorts and one long form. It's like, you know, if you want to make yeah. a long form, mix them in, you know, you can mix a few shorts in here and there. Do what like Ryan Train and Eric are doing right now. I think they're doing a good job of integrating them in without, you know, covering the channel in them. Yeah, because at one point for my channel, I was like posting like 10 shorts, 20 shorts, and then a podcast. And then I post 20, 50 shorts, and then a podcast. That was another reason why my channel kind of like stopped doing well because shorts followers, subscribers aren't that active sometimes. So yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it makes it makes sense. It makes sense. And that's one a little lesson for you that I'm sure you're learning from. Yeah, definitely. So do you think someone who is just starting out should do quality or quantity? Do you think someone who's bigger like Mr. B should do quality or quantity or someone in the middle with like 100,000 subscribers? What do you think? They should do i think definitely at the start like a 100 percent at the start you should do quantity not quality now obviously in an ideal world you do both but that's not always feasible i would just recommend someone at the beginning of their journey just put out as much content as, as you can and um, obviously don't put out terrible videos but like maybe set yourself a target if i want to upload every three days and just stick with that and do it for a year like up upload you know 100 videos or, or whatever or 200 videos and uh, you know the rationale is pretty simple like you you make you get better by making you don't get better by sitting and researching and watching every Patty Galloway video and reading every thread and just constantly thinking. Yeah. You get better by actually doing and, you know, combining all that research with actual action and, and seeing exactly. what your data is telling you. Um, but then as you grow as a YouTuber, I am generally a fan of the, the quality approach and really focusing on making, you know, exceptional content on its own. So I think like, it's situational, but generally speaking for bigger channels, I want them to move towards higher, higher quality and bigger swings as in going for more mm -hmm. viral content. I took over a channel. I, I started working with the channel. I should say I took over um, in November of last year. And they were doing like three or four videos a week, two or three, two to four videos a week consistently. And since working with them, we've kind of like five X the views per video. Like we've really increased views and we've uploaded about a third of the videos. So we're uploading way less. And it's just because they'd already got to a point where they had like a few hundred thousand subscribers. They already had like a good team. They had like relatively good ideas, but they just needed that extra effort on making bangers, like actual banger ideas. And, and that's what's yeah. made a big difference to them. Which is why YouTubers like Eric, Mr. Peace and Right Trahan are doing which are some like the best performing right now on YouTube and all of them are doing quality because they already have exactly exactly so do you think people should stick to a niche like all content on one channel or one type of video on one channel or many different channels about different niches kind of like Jackson says life was like 10 different channels this is a question I get a lot and I think I think the issue is the average person has so many interests that they want their YouTube channel just to reflect those interests and then you see you know oh, I'm into gaming here's some gaming videos I'm into music Here's some music videos, you know, I'm into uh, the outdoors. Here's some videos of me exploring caves or something all on the one channel. You see that um, for me, it's like when a channel starts, I want them to not be afraid to experiment because at the end of the day, when you're starting, as I said, it is about getting content out there. But if you're trying to grow and build a channel, you need to think about your channel as a catalog of content. And you have to think about a user coming onto your channel and watching video after video after video after video in a row that's how you kind of want them to feel about your content you want content that's so simple and easy to understand for youtube if like this is gaming content this is minecraft content that's all it um so i always recommend focusing on one thing and i actually don't really recommend splitting to other channels i just sort of say 
How about we just keep those interests, our interests? We don't have to make YouTube videos on them. Let's pick one of our interests and make the channel around that and almost intentionally pigeonhole ourselves into that specific thing because we're going to play by the rules and, you know, build build the right type of audience for, for one specific niche as opposed to trying to audiences across different uh, forms of content. So another mistake I see is like, yeah, one mistake is people make it all on the same channel. Another mistake is people make 10 channels with 10 different interests and then their whole attention gets completely, you know, frayed and all over the place and they can't actually focus on building a single one. Yeah. And if you have like 10 different channels, how hard that is to manage. Like if you're doing weekly videos, that's 10 videos you have to make a week, which exactly. is like sometimes to a day. What do you think is an underused tool to grow on YouTube? Like something like Title Generator, VidIQ, TubeBuddy. I, I like I like VidIQ. I like TubeBuddy. They have some useful features. Something I quite like in VidIQ is the competitor tool where you can essentially add other channels that have a similar type of content to you. Put it in the comparative, comparative tool and it shows you like which videos are performing well and like gives you some details on the channel. I think that's quite useful because it gives you a kind of an idea of how other people are doing and what's working with them. But after that, I just think there's some useful tools with both of those softwares, but also people need to be careful not to use them in the wrong way. So for example, some people use these like SEO optimizers and like trying to get the 100% score on TubeBuddy. And they do, they're doing titles like that, except they're trying to make content for browsing suggested. So they're trying to make entertaining challenge videos, but then they're putting all these keywords to try yeah. to get a good SEO score. They're trying to make browse content and suggested content work in search, which is a big mistake I see all the time. Yeah, I have I have done that before when I tried to like, I've done that so many times before, like using rapid tags and stuff like that. So VidIQ or TubeBuddy. I personally use TubeBuddy because I have, I got gifted TubeBuddy Legend, but yeah, like which do you think is better to use? It's funny because I know I, I know both I know people behind both of the software. If I if I was to sort of say if I was to break it down, I think for general tools, I think VidIQ is is better from what from my own use case and experience. Just they've got more features. They've got you know I think the views per hour is really interesting and a few of the things they have is really interesting. But ShoeBuddy's A/B testing for bigger channels is is really powerful. So I I actually need both. I want both yeah. and I want to use both at the same time. They're both really helpful. I've used both, but now I switched to like two buddy because like I mentioned, like I got gifted to buddy legend and like it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. So what's one piece of advice? I know we're, we're, we have been talking about advice on how to grow on YouTube this whole podcast, but what's one piece of advice that you would give to someone who wants to start doing YouTube? It's like grow the most they can. I would say I think the, the, the one of the most important things when you're starting on YouTube is to set the right time. So I see it all the time where people are like, you know, I need to blow up before this happens or, you know, I'm, I'm leaving college. And I'm trying to grow on YouTube. I need to blow up in six months. And to me, it's kind of like the way of YouTube is it's like starting a business. You know, you, you don't start a, a startup and say, you know, I've got six months to make this work. You know, it's it's better just to kind of view it as a, a long term thing and then view and try to build your life around being able to make content as opposed to saying I've got six months to make something happen. One of my biggest pet peeves is when a client comes in. I, I wouldn't call it pet peeves, but, you know, one, one thing that annoys me a little bit was when a client comes into me and they're like, I want to like 10 X growth in the next three months. And I'm like, that does happen. And it, it, it does happen like that has happened. I've, I've worked on channels where we've, we've managed to do that. But it's rare. And anyone that tells you, like, if someone's trying to sell you something and say they can 10x your growth or 10x your, you know, your videos or whatever, they're probably trying to sell you some some BS, in my opinion. So generally speaking, I think my my advice is usually setting that right time horizon and also coming from a place of actually wanting to make the content. Again, this sounds like a bit like a, a cliche answer. So many people they think they want to be YouTubers. I actually got a I do Q and A's on my Instagram and I got a question recently, which is like, you know, I'm doing YouTube, but I'm just really like I don't really enjoy doing the videos. Um, I've been putting myself under so much pressure to make it work. Nothing's working for me. You know, what should I do? And I'm like, the there's the problem with that question is the very first line. I don't enjoy making videos. Why are you on YouTube? That's like saying I'm a soccer player, but I don't enjoy kicking the ball. You know, <laughs> like, but I do like you know, imagine imagine saying I want to be a soccer player because of all the money and riches and fame, but I hate kicking a ball. You know, it's like you're looking at the end result as opposed to the process that gets Doesn't you there. Sense. Exactly. So like I think there's there's plenty of like specific things you can go into, but I think one of the most important things when you're starting on YouTube is just getting the time horizon right. Don't don't feel like there's any kind of magic pill or fix or course or this or that that's going to change everything for you. You need to think more about, do I like making content? If yes, good. Next level. What do I like doing? I like doing football. I like talking about music. I like gaming. Okay, which is a good opportunity? Which which would I like to make content of? Okay, I want to make gaming videos. Okay, what game? Minecraft. Okay, make 100 videos. See if you still like it. See if you get anywhere. If you don't get anywhere, no big deal. If you don't go anywhere, if you don't get anywhere and you don't like it, 
you can just stop. No one's forcing you to do YouTube. If you make 100 videos and you do like it, even if you don't get anywhere, you could keep going. You could try something different. You could experiment. If you make 100 videos and you get somewhere, you know, keep going. So that's kind of the break it down. That is some amazing advice. I think the best advice I've gotten on the podcast. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It really means a lot. And before we end this, is there anything else you want to promote? Um, no, honestly, like I, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure to be here. Really, really love what you're doing. And I, I always, I always want to make sure I don't condescend, but still, like I, I think it's, it's amazing you're doing this at your age. You're, you're bringing on some really cool guests. I was flicking through your channel before this, before this call and looking. I haven't saw some people that I've actually uh, done a call with, like Shan, yeah. Shan in, in the past, a few people. So like, really, really well done on what you're doing. And I don't want to promote anything. I don't have anything to sell. So I guess if you, if you enjoy my what I said in this podcast, feel free to check out my videos and my Twitter. It's free. Yeah, I'll be in the description. Please go follow him. Make some amazing content. And I'll see you next episode of the Nicocast.